Hey everybody, welcome to Off the Shelf Board Game Reviews. This week I thought I'd do something a little bit fun with Cthulhu Wars being on their Onslaught 3 Kickstarter. I thought it'd be kind of fun to do a little bit of a buyer's guide on Cthulhu Wars. It's no secret that I enjoy the game quite a bit. I actually landed my top 20 in my top 51 board games of all time. I did a quick video series on it, did a tutorial video, and I am actually planning on reshooting that tutorial video. That original tutorial video was actually shot when the original version of the game came out for Onslaught number 1. And since then, they have modified the rules of games for the game just a little bit. Not a big deal. They haven't actually changed the rules. They've just turned, changed the turn structure. But I still want that video review, that tutorial, to be pretty darn accurate. So I do plan on reshooting here pretty soon. But what I thought would be really, really fun, especially with the Onslaught being up there, and that big burning question on everybody's mind is, if I like Cthulhu Wars, if I'm interested in Cthulhu Wars, where do I begin? Where do I start? Where do I go from there? And exactly what should I do with Cthulhu Wars? So what I'm presenting here is pretty much my opinion, what I would suggest as a buyer's guide for Cthulhu Wars. Now before we go any further on this, I need to give a little bit of preamble. For Cthulhu Wars, I play this game predominantly as a four to six player game. Every time I play this game, it's pretty much four to six players. I played a little bit beyond the six players, and yeah, I've played three players, and I've also played two players, but predominantly most of my experience and most of my enjoyment has been in the four to six player range. So understand, a lot of these recommendations I'm about to give you are going to have a very strong bias of a four to six player game. Now the game does play as two players. I think it's okay as a two player game. The rules definitely work, but I don't think that's where the game shines. And the game does play very well at three players, but the game can play a little bit differently at three players. And it can also play a little bit differently when you're talking about eight players. But it really doesn't matter when you're talking about eight players, because at that point you probably have to own everything for the game at that point anyways. So this video, like I said, is going to be a sweet spot four to six player video with all my suggestions where you should start with Cthulhu Wars how you should proceed once you got the base game and just what experience I think they off, most, offer the most bang for their buck dollar value and add the most variety and the most fun to Cthulhu Wars that's enough of the ramble let's get on to the best part and show you where my recommendations fall for Cthulhu Wars First up, basic bang up for the buck, I think your best first investment for Cthulhu Wars is to start looking towards some of the other factions. Now I think the factions add the most variety to the game and they're probably the best way to start improving your gameplay because this is an extremely asymmetric game and I'm not going to start harping all this stuff because that's not the purpose of this video review, but this game is so asymmetric that the more factions you, factions you add to the game, the more variety you're going to get out of the game and the more replay you're going to get out of the game. I mean the basic game already has a lot of variety because those factions play so differently and you can play your game and change up the gameplay just by playing a fact you never played before and seeing different strategies and different ways to play the game. Now the basic box does come for two to four players but the map inside the game allows you to play up to five players. So straight up out of the box you're allowed to play up to five players so you already need to buy a faction if you want to get the extra fun out of the game. So now we come to the fact of what factions do you buy to start adding a lot of variety to the game. Well we kind of have two starting points here for Cthulhu Wars if you want to start adding a lot more variety and a lot more fun to the game. If you're just buying the basic box for Cthulhu Wars, nothing else, you haven't played any games, or maybe you played a game or two or checked out a couple of videos, the very first faction I'm going to recommend for you is to go ahead and pick up the Windwalker faction. Now the Windwalker faction is really good for players who have not played the game a lot because the faction doesn't do a lot of crazy things like the other faction I'm about to recommend in here in just a second. But what they do is they play kind of like a bruiser faction and they're going to come on very slowly and they're going to slowly build up power and towards the end of the game they're going to have a lot of power and the basic idea for the Windwalker faction again over generalizing here is they're going to slowly build up their power I mean they do have the nice benefit of having two, in, or two ancient old ones here for their faction but the basic idea is to slowly build up power and then just have one turn where they control a lot of gates and just hammer the other players especially since they have a spell book that allows them to do a ritual of annihilation for a cost of five, it doesn't matter how far along they happen to be on the track. So the basic idea of the game for this faction is just to kind of beat up on the other players and then have one round where they stomp really, really hard on the other players, get a lot of victory points and basically seal their victory. They also have a couple different abilities to start spawning more Wendigos across the board as they play, thanks to the abilities of a fact and spellbook. And also they have a unit that when it dies, it takes things out with it. So it adds a little bit of variety and a little bit of fun to the game. So this is a really nice faction ad for players who don't have a lot of experience because the faction itself is not hard to understand. It's a pretty basic way to explain it to new players. But like the rest of the game of Cthulhu Wars, there's still enough variety and still enough fun in the game that this is one faction that can add more variety to the game, but still not too difficult for new players to play. That's the Windwalker faction.
Next up, we have the Open of the Way faction. Now, the Open of the Way faction is a really interesting faction, and this is the alternate faction I was mentioning when I was talking a moment ago about the Windwalker, because the Open of the Way faction is a faction for more experienced players. And this is where we have that kind of cutoff, like I was talking about just a couple moments ago. If you have played Cthulhu Wars quite a bit and you own only the base game and everybody's very familiar with the factions, everybody understands how all the factions work and you all have started working towards your strategies that you really like with your specific factions, this would actually be the first faction I would recommend to players to buy at that point. And again, this is just assuming you have the base box of Cthulhu Wars. If you just have the base box and you played it lots of times, I would suggest the Open of the Way faction. Here's why. The Open of the Way faction is an advanced faction that actually does a lot more things that change up the gameplay to the game. Now, what the Open of the Way faction does is brings extra special abilities that you've never seen before from the other factions. Of course, we've seen how some of the other factions kind of change up the way the game plays, especially Yellow Sign has multiple ways to win. Well, the Open of the Way is the first faction that can start messing with the gates and how they operate on the board in a couple different ways. First of all, you have your great old one who actually acts as a gate in almost every aspect of the game. It is actually a living gate that can move all over the board and has the ability to move as a living gate and go all over the board. But the really cool thing about that is the fact that you have a couple spell books which add a lot of variety and a lot of interesting gameplay to the game. Because you have the first spell book, they break through, that gives you the ability to start summoning your monsters at gates that nobody controls or gates that you don't even control. So this means that this is a faction that can start attacking enemies be behind their own lines. Because if they have gates that are uncontrolled, bring a big bad guy at that gate because you don't need a cultist there. If they have gates that they already control, it doesn't matter. Bring in your bad guys over there because you now have the secondary function of what's really, really cool about this faction. If they are ever in a battle and they have the correct spell book, they can start promoting their units into more powerful units if they happen to survive the battle. Cultists can turn into mutants. Mutants can turn into abominations, and abominations can turn into these nasty little guys. Again, create more variety and create a lot more gameplay and pre bringing out a lot more ability for this faction to shake up the gameplay quite a bit. That doesn't even also factor in the fact that this is a faction that has two spell books that can each be used only one time per game. This faction has one time use per game, and this spell book for the faction has a one time spell book that can only be used one time per game. So it adds a lot of variety and a lot of interesting gameplay, and this is almost a surgical faction is the best way I like to describe it. Because you kind of control the tempo of the game because you can move the gates around all the time. You also control the tempo because you have these very interesting one-time use spell books that you need to plan when to use. Of course, the trick is you can't sit there and wait forever for that perfect opportunity to come up because it may never happen, and then you may end up losing the game. So this is a very interesting faction that has a lot of balance, a lot of interesting gameplay, and actually shakes up the gameplay quite a bit, which is why I like to recommend this as a first faction to pick up if you have the base game, you have played it quite a bit, and you're looking for some new variety of Cthulhu Wars. Again, if you've never played Cthulhu Wars and you're looking for that fifth faction, definitely recommend the Windwalker. But if you're looking for variety and a lot of difference, I am definitely going to recommend the Opener as your next faction to pick up. Next up we have the Sleeper Faction, which is another very interesting faction, and this is a faction I would suggest, again, for a little bit more experienced players. So again, if you have no experience, grab that Windwalker Faction, and then after that you pretty much have a toss-up between the Opener and the Sleeper Faction. I personally like the Opener just a little bit better, but that's because I kind of like the chaos it creates by the ability to move the gates around and by having that nice living gate. But I can see any argument for seeing the Sleeper as just as good, or maybe buying before the Opener, just depending on what kind of strategies and what kind of gameplay you like. Now, the Sleeper Faction is a really interesting faction because they also are very good at controlling the tempo of the game, but they're also very good at making a lot of problems for all the other players because they have some very interesting spell books. See, the Sleeper Faction is one of the only factions in the game that allows you to start mimicking other factions' abilities. And I'm sure you can imagine already just how powerful it can be to mimic another player's ability. Another player is using an ability and you like that ability and it's doing a lot of things to you, just say, you know what? Take this nice serpent man here because I now have the spell book which allows me to copy one of your abilities. And yes, that does mean you can even copy Cthulhu's ability to start getting Elder Signs every time you bring your Great Old One into play. Now, they have a very decent Great Old One. His attack power is variable depending on who you're attacking and what time part of the turn you're attacking him in. But he's still a very decent Great Old One, so he does offer some very good power in that aspect. But this faction has a lot of abilities that they can control the tempo of the game, they can control the tempo of their own turns, and they can, matter of fact, make sure that they are always, always last to go on every single turn. 
after all the players have exhausted their power. And I'm sure you can imagine in this game, if you play Cthulhu Wars a couple times, having power at the end of the turn when nobody has any power left over is a time when all your opponents start sweating because they realize that you're going to start wrecking a lot of havoc and a lot of devastation across their lines and creating a lot of problems for the faction. So the Sleeper faction is a really awesome faction. There's a couple of spell books I'll just go over really quickly. I mentioned the Asian Sorcery one I've already mentioned to you, which allows you to send Serpent Men over there to steal some of their abilities, but they also have the ability to demand sacrifice. And demand sacrifice, make sure that you're either not going to lose a lot of units after battles, or the other player needs to start feeding you Elder Signs, which is free victory points for you every time you start attacking. And then you have the very final ability, which I think is very awesome, where you can start capturing opponents' monsters. Not only can you capture their cultists, but you can capture their monsters and start sacrificing their monsters for power at the beginning of every phase. Because now you have taken their monsters off the board, removed them from their pool, and you know that's going to be extra points of power for you when we go to the sacrifice part. When everybody's just sacrificing cultists, you're also sacrificing enemy monsters for all that extra power. Again, controlling the tempo, making sure that you have a lot of power, making sure at the end of every single round you're still going to have power, and lots of ability to start wrecking havoc. Including one final thing I haven't even mentioned, your faction's unique ability that you're always going to be able to bring out units all the time, no matter what. That's a sleeper faction. Next up we have the Chocho Faction. Now the Chocho Faction is a faction I would actually recommend getting after you've purchased a couple of terrors or a couple of the horrors because this is an extremely advanced faction. This faction is so advanced to the point that I would not recommend getting this faction until you purchase all the other factions for the game and have at least one or two of the terrors or horrors or even maybe some of the other things before you pick up this faction. It's not because this is a bad faction. They are actually far from that. It's just that this faction is very, very advanced in how this faction plays. Because the, this game, Cthulhu Wars itself, is a very aggressive game. It's all about going out there and attacking other players, and all the factions have fit that mold until the point where the Chochos came out. We now have our very first Cheetah Turtle faction in the game, and that can create a lot of different gameplay and a lot of different ways to play the game. And if you don't understand the way Cthulhu Wars plays, the strategies of the game, this is going to be a faction that's going to frustrate a lot of players. Because you're either going to feel this faction is overpowered, or you're going to feel like this faction is underpowered, and again, you're not going to see how balanced this faction is until you have a lot of experience with the game. To avoid rambling here, I'm just going to basically go over why this happens. This faction is a faction that, well, you can pretty much say it's about any faction, but especially this faction itself. If you leave this faction alone to do their thing, they will win this game 95% of the time, which seems crazy, which makes you think this faction is unbalanced. And it's not, because as I said, if you leave the faction alone to do its thing, they're probably going to win the game. So that means all the other players at the table need to do one thing just to disrupt them a little bit. Because this faction is much like the Cheetah. It comes on very strong, but it loses gas very quickly. And if they don't get their ball rolling soon enough, they cannot win the game. So just to give you a really good example of what I mean by this, the first time we played with the Chocho faction, they dominated the table. After that, we've kind of played a couple more times, and now I'm at the point that if there's any factions such as Crawling Chaos in the game, I have yet to win the game again playing the Chocho at the Crawling Chaos from the map. Because the Crawling Chaos has the ability to have some very good movement across the board, and that shuts down the Chocho completely. Because like I said, this is a faction that their whole purpose is to sit there. And of course, I really am overgeneralizing here, so I don't think this is a dominant strategy. But the idea of the faction is to sit there, have two or three gates, sit there and do just your little thing, guard those gates, stay in your little corner of the map and sit there and start gaining victory points. And this faction will do that if other players let them. But if you have a faction such as Crawling Chaos who will just move in and, oh, I don't know, devour a high priest, devour a cultist, and the faction starts falling apart. It really does. And again, this is why that this faction has to be played almost to a razor's edge. The idea of the faction when you play it, at least in my experience, is you have to be playing this faction in a way that you're gaining victory points at a steady pace, but not so steady that the other players see you as a threat. So you need to be doing your thing to gather your power, send your units out occasionally, kind of distract the other players so they don't see what you're doing, so you pull the victory out at the end of the game. So that's why this is a very, very balanced faction in that aspect, and you have to understand that going into the game, and if you don't, you can probably start seeing this as either an overbalanced or an underbalanced faction. That's why I recommend this as the absolute last thing you get after all the other expansions, faction expansions, and also after picking up a couple horrors or a couple of terrors or other things that have more variety of the game. 
It's a good faction. It's a lot of fun. It's added a lot of unique variety to the game, but just the way it plays, I definitely recommend it after doing all that. Now, the basic idea for this faction is this is a faction that always comes with High Priest. Now, the High Priest is a separate faction, and it's a faction expansion that I'm going to recommend further down this list. But what they do is they act pretty much just like the Acolytes, like you get with the basic game. But the idea for these is that they cost three power to bring into play. But at any time, at the end of any action, even if it's not your turn, you can sacrifice them to gain two power back. And that can be very powerful and allows you to prevent yourself from being lost or being without power or being unable to do anything at all. So that creates a very interesting dynamic. So this faction is based on them and also using the abilities such as the higher offense ability, which allows them to do other things, which allows them to earn spell books, or every time they earn a spell book, allows them to get more high priests out in play. And then they can use these high priests to start sacrificing for the ability such as martyrdom, which means if you send a big force out there to attack, you can assign one kill to one of your high priests and everything else is pain, so you're not going to lose units. You can also use your ability of the Tablet of the Gods, which allows you to control how the rituals go because the rituals are going to give you more victory points. So that's the interesting thing about this faction. Again, it plays really interesting. Again, it's a little bit of a turtle, a little bit of a cheetah. It comes out super fast out of the gate, but you've got to control your speed out of the gate so you don't paint a target on your forehead. Come out fast enough that you get far enough ahead above the other players so you can lock in the victory because this is a faction that loses steam very quickly. You do have a very nice old one that gains power based on the randomness of a die, and that can help you because if you get him out and you start getting some really good rolls, start rolling sixes, his power is going to ramp up very, very quickly. But if you start rolling lots of ones, his power isn't going to ramp up very quickly at all, so he's not going to gain as much power as he quickly should. So it's an interesting faction, adds a lot of interesting gameplay. But understand this is definitely a turtle faction. If you play this game with a lot of players who like to sit back and do absolutely nothing and build up their little base of power as they play the game in the first couple rounds, you're going to see this as a very unbalanced faction. But if you have players who are willing to go out there and probe against the other players and have a little bit of fun, you're going to see that this is an extremely balanced faction. And it may even be seen as a weak faction sometimes if you put too big of a target of yourself because the other players are going to come out there and just stomp you down. That's the Chocho -cho faction. Next up, we have the Terrors and the Neutral Factions, the Neutral Monsters you can buy for the game. And again, just to reemphasize what I said earlier, I would definitely look at picking up some of these before you pick up the Chocho -cho Faction. Again, not because it's a bad faction. I want to emphasize that. just want to emphasize that it's a faction that plays a lot differently than what a lot of people are used to. And I just think that these extra things are going to add a lot more variety to the game than having so many factions at this point. So you probably, depending on your player count, probably want to get about six different factions available for the game, whether that's the Windwalker, Plus one of the other ones I mentioned because you're new to the game, or maybe you want to get the sleeper and the opener because you play the game quite a bit and you want some factions to add a lot of variety and change things up and shake things up very well. After that, I definitely start looking towards getting some of these terrors and some of these neutral monsters. Now this one right here is actually one of the terrors that I actually like a lot, and this is the one I kind of suggest to my group that we kind of sneak in more often or not just because I like what these ones do because they add a little bit different variety and different gameplay mechanics. Now this is the Cosmic Terrors expansion for the game. It does come with these three terrors. Now terrors effectively are on the same level as monsters and the way terrors work is anybody can hire a terror and add them to their faction. And once you add them to your faction, they're a permanent part of your faction for the rest of the game. So just that point right there allows you to see that they add a lot of variety. If you've been playing Sleeper for a long time, you feel like you may be getting into a rut because you kind of play the Sleeper, oh I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Well, this adds a little bit more variety and also allows you to adjust the game because as other players start changing their strategies, forcing you to change your strategies, these can force them to change their strategies even more because these different terrors can affect how you're going to play the game because they add more different abilities and allow you to change up your gameplay so you don't get kind of stuck in a rut, which we all can do when we play a game you know, 15, 20, 30 times. We have a tendency as players to kind of fall in a rut and this is going to break that up quite a bit. Now my favorite one out of this box, the Cosmic Terrors, is going to be the Great Race of Yith. And the reason why I like these is because it stops people from turtling up quite a bit. And that's one of the things I enjoy about Cthulhu Wars, it is a little bit more of an aggressive game. That's why I have a lot of fun with it, because you really can't turtle up too much, unless you're playing the Chochos, obviously. But you can't turtle up too much because you got to go out there and be a little bit aggressive and go out there and earn those victory points. And that's why I like the Great Race of Yith, because what this race does is this allows you to capture cultists no matter what. And I'm sure you can appreciate how powerful that can be to uh, capture other players' cultists. I can move my great race of Yith in there. You can be protected by your great old one. 
The great race of Yith doesn't care. They're going to capture cultists because nothing protects your cultists if I want to capture them with this unit, which makes it very interesting and adds a lot of fun because you can kind of start playing mind games with other players. If I just move this towards your faction, towards where you got your cultists, you're going to start panicking, especially if I bring a couple other units along with me or maybe one of my own cultists because you know no matter what, if I get to that same area with that gate that you're protecting, I'm going to take that cultist away. There's nothing you can do about it because you can't protect that cultist at all. Can't throw your great old one out there as a cheap shield. Can't throw out another terror there as a cheap shield. You can't throw out anything because unless you actually kill this, I'm going to take that cultist, which adds a lot of interesting gameplay. Next thing this one adds is it adds the dole, which has a special ability of planetary destruction. What this does is every time the goal is killed or the dole is killed or eliminated in battle, not only do you gain Elder Signs, but you also force the other player to make a decision if they want to gain Doom or if they want to gain power. So it kind of creates an interesting moving target that you can add to your game. And again, it goes back to the psychology and the fun of, Elder, of playing Cthulhu Wars because you can kind of play with the other player's minds because do they want to go after as a target so they can gain that power and also possibly gain those Doom points. Maybe they need those Doom points really badly, but they know if they kill this Dole and take it away from you, they're going to give you some Elder Signs. If no, any of those three-point Elder Signs haven't been claimed yet, they can potentially give you six victory points by going after that. So do they risk it or not? So it kind of creates an interesting mind game. And I have abused the heck out of this guy playing that mind game with the other players by just moving them towards without any protectors. And they're going, okay, do I go after the dole and risk giving you victory points, or do I let this dole just stomp through my defenses knowing that if I don't kill it, it's going to start eating through me anyway. So what do I do? And that's one of the fun things about the dole. Then finally, we have this guy who I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Somebody help me here. It's something like Quachol Utuas or something along those lines. And I don't ever, ever claim to be an expert on the Cthulhu mythos. So I kind of fake my way through a lot of these pronunciations. But they have the post ability of dust to dust, which is very, very interesting. It says that if any unit is killed or eliminated in a battle, the other player has to make a decision. They either have to permanently, yes, permanently lose a unit so they no longer have access to that unit, or they have to decide if they just want to go ahead and give you an Elder Sign. Again, giving those victory points away kind of goes along with the duel. Very interesting. So I like how this guy plays because if I go out there and start using him as kind of a surgical assassin, I can start killing your guys, and if I kill them off, you need to start thinking, okay, if I don't give you an Elder Sign, I have just lost access to my big heavy hitter. Maybe I'm going to lose access to my three attack dice, my four attack dice guy. Can I afford to do that? Do I have a lot of backup units? So I have to give you Elder Signs, but if I give you Elder Signs, I'm giving you victory points. So I do like how these terrors right here add a lot of variety just by throwing this one expansion in the game. Even with the base game, you have these three guys who can add a lot of variety to the game. So that's why I really enjoy this to Cosmic Terrors pack, and it's probably one of the first ones I recommend any player is looking for extra variety after they purchase an extra faction or two for Cthulhu Wars. Next up we have the Independent Old Ones, and I like to recommend the Independent Old Ones after the Terrors, just because I have a lot of fun with the Terrors, and the Independent Old Ones are a lot of fun, but they do have a tendency, once in a great while, to end up being more late game things, whereas the Terrors and the Horrors, and the Monsters, the neutral ones especially, you can start adding them very, very early in the game, which shakes up the beginning of the game also. Now, I like these two right here, the Great Old Ones pack number four, and Great Old Ones pack number two, the best from all the ones I've seen. And if I have to choose between number four and number two, I'd probably pick number four first, but I definitely would pick number two next, just because I like the this guy right here, the spider guy here, because he does do something very interesting I'll cover here in just a second. But the Great Old One pack number four, what I like about it is I like the Great Old Ones this one actually adds to the game, because they do add some very interesting things that you'll see very quickly can partner up with already the other factions in the game, adding more variety to the game. First one we have right here is this guy right here, and again, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name, because I know I'll be made fun of. But what he does is he allows some of the other factions that play a little bit slower, that build up their base of power a little bit slower, to start making up the differences, whether through their special ability that he has that allows you to do a little bit of catch-up mechanic, or the ability that you can turn Rituals of Annihilation instead of Victory Points into ways to get power. And that can be a way to get a lot of power very quickly. They give you a turn where you can come out from behind or come out very slowly early in the game, bring him out, turtle up for one little bit of a round, and then come out with a very smashy round where you have tons of power, tons of ability to bring out a lot of things and basically just start tearing apart the board. 
you can imagine the amount of fun you can have with this guy if you combine him with the sleeper faction where the sleeper faction uses their ability to kind of play a little bit slowly then you come out with one round where you have well well beyond 20 power and tons of abilities to go around there and start smashing other players so that's kind of what i find very cool about this guy i also like this old one right here because this one is very interesting you have a pretty interesting powerful combat monster or combat great old one who has attack power of four only if you're the aggressor so you have to play a little more aggressively with this faction also as long as at least one of these guys is still alive on the board they're cheaper to bring out but if somebody manages to kill both of them they're very expensive to keep bringing out so it creates a really interesting dynamic where you always want to send one of these guys out and yes they are linked that's their special power they are linked so one thing happens to one you can help carry it over to the other one An example is movement if you pay to move one the other guy gets to move for free which is really cool but I like the ability that this one forces you to be a little bit aggressive. The more aggressive you are with these guys, the more attack dice you have, the more abilities you have to go out there. And again, if you only lose one, you really don't care because it only costs you two power to bring them back out. This guy is also cool. He allows you to start messing with the other player's cultists, which is kind of nice to start screwing over the other players and their ability to control the gates. So if you have somebody who's starting to rest on the laurels and trying to take advantage of all their gates while sitting back, bring this guy out that's going to change your strategies up really quickly but that's the great old one pack four now what i really like about the great old one pack two and especially this guy right here is he becomes a very interesting thorn in every single player's side because he now has created another way to win the game and it doesn't matter at all the current status of the game because we all know the typical rules for cthulhu wars you only win the game if you have all six of your spell books and the most doom points into the game not with this guy. With this guy, if you manage to get all six of your webs out on the board anywhere, it doesn't matter how many spell books you have, doesn't matter how many doom points you have, does not matter at all because you win the game. So now he creates a really interesting dynamic for every single one of the factions in the game because as soon as somebody gets control of this guy, everybody now has a big target that they know exactly what to go to because they do not want you getting out these six web tokens. Because all it takes is for you to get all six of these web tokens out, and you instantly win the game. You could have one spellbook, doesn't matter. You can have the least amount of doom points, doesn't matter. You're still going to be the grand victor of the game. Plus, there's other factions that really work very well with all the other factions. I like Father Dagon. He's actually really cool to use if you're playing with Great Cthulhu, because he does have the ability to start allowing you to control the oceans better. And we all know that is something Cthulhu likes to do. He likes to control the oceans. So if you have Father Dagon, it can help you with those abilities also. So between these two factions, i probably recommend number four first, just because of the variety it adds in here. But number two itself is also a very great addition, just because it's going to add this guy, who adds a lot of variety, shakes up the gameplay, is definitely going to force all the players to readjust their strategies and how they play the game of Cthulhu Wars. Next up, we have the Ramsey Campbell Horrors Packs. Now, there's a one and a two, and basically, these are really good if you're a little bit more on a budget or you want more variety for the same amount of money that you're putting into the game because every one of these boxes comes with a couple independent old ones and a couple monsters in the box. So, again, you do get the variety of seeing both those things in one single box. Now, there's two boxes, like I said, the number one and the number two. I actually prefer the number two over the number one, and the reason why is because the number one adds a lot more variety to how the cultists and interrupting how the cultists play and actually force the players to change up the strategy with the cultists a little more, which can be good, especially if you notice that your players are starting to not really appreciate the power of the cultists that much. So that one can be pretty darn good for that aspect, but I like this one because it actually shakes things up a lot more because you have abilities to start messing with the great old ones of the other players, which is something I really like, especially with the ability that you can start forcing other players to lose all their power from the great old ones. And I'm sure you can imagine the ability to shut down another player's great old one 100% in a battle can be very, very devastating, especially if you have some of those combat monsters who like to roll 10 or more combat dice just for the great old one, and you know exactly which factions I'm talking about, but the ability to complete them and shut them down with one single model can be absolutely devastating to those factions. So it creates an interesting dynamic, and that's why I think I prefer this one over the other one. But I can definitely suggest that if you notice that a lot of players are not appreciating the power of the cultists, or you notice that they're not doing their much as they could be with their cultists, or if you just want more variety with your cultists, probably want to pick up Ramsey, Horrors, Ramsey Campbell's Horrors Pack number one first. But if you're looking for just a lot more variety and shaking up the end game itself, I would definitely recommend number two as your first purchase.
Next up, we have all the map packs that are available for Cthulhu Wars. Now, there's a lot of map packs, and they do add a lot of variety to the game. And if you are looking for extra variety, they can be a lot of fun, but I definitely do emphasize that you should definitely get a look at all the other factions and getting a couple of terrors and a couple of other things and adding them just to the basic Earth map before you start looking at all these faction maps. And these faction maps are really fantastic, and they're a lot of fun, but you can get almost the same amount of enjoyment out of just playing the basic Earth map by adding a couple of terrors, a couple of great independent old ones, or adding even the basic faction independent old ones, or even using the color gates out of space, which is a free download you can download from the website. All these things can add almost the same amount of variety as just by adding these map packs. So that's why I'm putting them a little bit further down the, the list here. Not because they're bad, not because I don't enjoy them. I think they're actually really fantastic. They add a lot of fun. But if you're looking at getting to go through the wars I and mean, going through the progress of adding more and more stuff to the game to enjoy it, I think that you can get just as much enjoyment by adding those other things before you start looking at all these map packs. And also, I should go without saying that if you're playing with six or more players, you do have to get the map packs for more players. And I would definitely recommend you get the Earth map very first, the six to eight player Earth map, before you look at any of those map packs. And then you can start looking at all these other map packs and see if there's something you want to add to the game. The first thing we have to look at here is there's a couple different ones. And now I actually prefer two of them quite a bit. I like this one right here, which is a library. I think this is a fantastic one. And I also like the Primeval map. Now, if I had to choose between the two, I'm not quite sure which one I like more. It depends on who I'm playing with, how many people I'm playing with, whether I like each one or more than the other one. I really like the Primeval map because it gets very claustrophobic, which can be a lot of fun. And it basically forces the players to start acting before they're even ready, which creates a really interesting dynamic and a lot of fun in the game. I think it's really fun. But I also like the library because it starts adding extra spellbooks and an extra dynamic between the custodian and the librarian enforcing the players and how they play the game. I also like how the map is laid out. It's basically, you're not looking like a globe or anything like that. You're basically looking at a giant building where if you had this map, you'd have one level above the other one. And you see all these floors are connected by stairwells or connected by different teleporters and everything like that. So it's pretty cool how it works and it kind of does kind of a brain thing where you're kind of going, okay, this is connected to this, to this, to this. Okay, so I have to protect on this front because that player is moving over here. So it's kind of cool how that works. It forces your brain to work in a different way, which is something I really like. So if I had a toss up, I really had to buckle down and decide which map I like better. I would probably say the Primeval is my favorite map from all the extra maps for the game. This would be a very, very close second as my second favorite one. Then you have the other ones, which I think are really good. But I, I have to be honest with you, I haven't had enough experience on, with those other map packs to give you a dominant opinion to decide which one of those would be my number three and my number four in the map packs. But I'm pretty sure Primeval is my favorite, and this is definitely my second favorite one. Now, like I said, Primeval, which I don't have here, place before you, I just have the library one to show you very quickly here. But the Primeval one, what that does is it has extra Ice Age tokens that you can add to the board, which is going to basically, in effect, cause the board to shrink. That's going to force all the players to start changing how they work and how they play their factions, and you can't rest on your laurels anymore because the board is constantly shrinking, which forces all the players to play differently. And then this faction that I do have before you, what it does is it adds the abilities for players to get extra spell books, which can change how you're playing the game. Now these spell books are not going to replace the spell books that go on your basic faction card. These are extra spell books that you can get that are going to give you extra powers. Although it is a gamble to get these because if you have these spell books, you have to start worrying about the librarian who is going to want to collect these spell books and return them to the board. So you have this interesting dynamic where players are taking the gamble of taking these spell books and hoping that another player doesn't send the librarian after them to gain these spell books back. And the way they take these spell books back is by slapping around a whole bunch of times, taking some doom points from you, maybe taking some units from you or some various other ways so it can be very hampering. So it's a very strong gamble. So you need to decide if going after that spell book is worth the potential loss you may have to suffer if somebody sends the librarian against you. And of course, there's also the custodian who's pretty much immortal. He can't be defeated and he's just slowly going to wander around the map making everybody's life more difficult. So it creates an interesting dynamic with this map where this guy is slowly moving around this guy is slowly going after the people who are taking the gambles on these spell books while you have this mind game of this three-dimensional world that you're trying to figure out all the movements with the gates and the stairs and everything. So it creates a really interesting dynamic and it's a lot of fun. So if you're going to look at all these different map packs, obviously if you're playing six to eight players, get that Earth map pack first. I'm going to tell you that right now. You can have so much fun just playing the basic Earth map by adding a couple of terrors, a couple of horrors and everything and have a heck of a lot of fun with Cthulhu Wars. If you've done that now and you're looking for more maps to look into, check out Primeval. That's the next one I'm going to recommend for you. After Primeval, look at getting the library. 
of course, I would probably shuffle between those two as my number one, number two, depending on your play group. If you don't like the idea of the primeval map is going to force you to play faster than you like, you may want to look at the library first because, again, extra variety of the spellbooks can be pretty darn cool. But if you want a map that's going to shake things up, force players to change their strategies on the fly as the map is shrinking, check out the primeval map. And then the other maps out there, they're also enjoyable, but they are going to add a little more variety to the game in a way that's going to require you to be a lot more familiar with Cthulhu Wars, especially the final map on that alien planet, which is going to change things up so much in Chaz, a lot of different chaos and different ways to play the game. So those are the map packs for Cthulhu Wars. Next up, we have the Azathoth faction. Now, I can't put them on the table because I'm not done painting them, but this is a really interesting thing that they added to the game because this is a faction that is actually an independent, complete faction. Now, I would suggest getting this faction in the order after you have all the base game factions, except the Chocho. After you've looked at getting a couple of horrors and a couple of terrors, you're either going to look at getting the map packs, or I would suggest getting the Azathoth faction. Either get one or the other, decide which one you like, because I think they both pretty much fall in the same spot. The map packs have a tendency to add a little bit of variety to the way the game plays itself, and Azathoth has a way to do that too, because what you're doing with the Azathoth faction is this is a faction that's going to be set off to the side and everybody has access to the faction, and they're going to purchase the spell books. I guess purchase is the wrong word, but you know what I mean here. They're going to purchase the spell books and add them onto their own faction boards to create different ways to build up how their faction works. So now you've made it so every single faction available to the game is now going to play a little bit differently depending on how you're buying those neutral spell books. And again, those can count towards your six spell books you need to win the game. So again, you've kind of made every single faction in the game play just a little bit differently by having all these different models that you can use, having all these different spell books and all these different abilities that's going to give you. So it creates a really interesting dynamic. And if I had to really choose and sit down between them, either pick a map pack or the Azathoth faction, I would probably pick this one first before I picked up the maps, but again, that's just because I see how much variety you can get just with a basic Earth map, just by adding a couple horrors, adding a couple terrors, and adding a couple great old ones, or you can even go to the Sandy Peterson's website for Cthulhu Wars at petersongames.com, and you can download all the extra rules to use every one of the great old one faction great old ones for anyone that's not currently involved in the game that you're playing, there's rules there so you can use every one of those as an independent gradle one. That's a download that's available over on their website. There's also the color gates out of where it allows you to change up the way the gates are going to work, and that's another thing you can download from the website. So that does add a lot of variety just with the basic earth map. That's why I would say that if you really are hard pressed between getting the map packs or this faction right here, definitely get this faction first, then start looking at getting some of those map packs to add the extra variety to the game. So now that we've covered pretty much everything, there's only a couple extra things to cover here that I probably consider the last things I'd purchase to make your collection of Cthulhu Wars complete. Then I'm going to go ahead and take a few moments to actually talk about the Onslaught 3 and what's available for them and what changes are to come with that final, possibly final update for Cthulhu Wars, unless they do an Onslaught 4, Onslaught 4 which I'm pretty sure they may not do, but who knows what the future may hold. Finally, we come down to the High Priest. Now, the High Priest are the last thing I would recommend to purchase for the game. Not because there's anything wrong with the High Priest. It's just that I think they offer the least amount of variety and the least amount of extra fun that you can add to Cthulhu Wars. Basically, just to break it down, all the High Priest is is an Acolyte, which becomes a permanent battery for your faction. Each faction only gets one, unless you're playing the Cho-Cho, then you get up to three of them. And basically, at any time, literally any time, even during a Doom phase, to ensure that you can go first, you can sacrifice one of your high priests to get two power back. So it's basically a power battery for you. And you can see how some factions can definitely gain some bonuses from that. And well, actually any faction gain bonuses from it. But you can see some factions are going to be assisted more by that ability. So you're going to spend three power to bring a high priest into pay, play. And for all game purposes, 100% all the game purposes, they actually act like an acolyte. They can control gates. They can do all those things that an acolyte can do. But again, at any time, you can sacrifice and gain two power back. So, like I said, it's a good way to store up a little bit of power, but every faction can only have one High Priest, unless you're the Cho-Cho. Then you get three of them. So you can see that you have the ability to create later turns where you can have some extra power. So they're not that bad, but again, they don't add as much to the game as some of the other ones can. And I'm sure Peterson Games is going to yell at me for saying this, or somebody's going to yell at me for saying this, but with something that simple to add to the game, 
you really don't even need this faction pack. And I'm going to talk about this when I talk about Onslaught 3 in just a couple moments here, which almost makes these kind of obsolete. And I hate to say that, but, you know, we all have our budgets. We all only have so much money we can spend. And anywhere we can save a little bit of money, it's always a little bit worth it. But I'm going to preface that by saying that if you do want the High Priest, you definitely want to go through and download from Peterson's website the unique High Priest rules. And what this is going to do is it's going to add rules for every one of these High Priests so they can each have their own unique powers, which is going to change up the way they work so every single player is going to have access to a unique High Priest. Now this is the one thing I would definitely suggest makes this package very, very worth it. If you are going to do that and you want to use the unique High Priest, they do add a lot of variety to the game, add some interesting mechanics to the game, and for that reason alone, I would definitely say go purchase High Priest if you want to do the unique High Priest. But if you're just looking for something to add extra to the game, you have no intentions of using these unique High Priests, they are pretty much on the bottom of the list for all my suggestions of what to buy for the Cthulhu Wars because they literally just add that one thing, a new priest that you can add that you can sacrifice any time for two power. They cost three to bring into play. As a free action, you sacrifice and get two of that power back. So you're basically losing one power. So it's not even a something that you're going to use to abuse in any way to gain power. It's basically what you're, something you're going to use on an emergency basis. If you spent all your power, you notice that sleeper still has a couple power left and they're starting to stomp towards your gates, sacrifice your priest to get a little bit of power so you can at least do something to defend yourself. Something along those lines. So again, they add interesting mechanics, but if you look at the global scheme of Cthulhu Wars, all the variety you get from the extra factions, all the variety you get from the terrors, the horrors, the independent great old ones, the great old ones using the factions, the, all the special maps, everything you can add to the game compared to the high priest, they're probably the last thing I would suggest for getting the game. So now let's go ahead and wrap all this up. Go ahead and look at some of the fun things that are going to be added with Onslaught number three. just want to take a couple minutes here and just talk about Onslaught 3 and where you may stand with Cthulhu Wars. Now, if you're interested in Cthulhu Wars, you do not own anything for the game itself, you probably want to look into getting into Onslaught 3 because for the basic level for $200, you get one full copy of the game, plus you can get one faction of your choice. So you basically already are saving quite a bit of money over just buying the base box, plus a faction because you're going to get all the stretch goals, and the stretch goals are actually pretty cool and add some really cool variety to the game. So for $200, you get to pick any one faction you like, and if you've been watching the rest of this video, I'm just going to quickly recap here and just let you know that if you're buying the base game, you probably haven't played Cthulhu that much, so you probably want to pick up the $200 pledge plus pick up the Windwalker faction. It's going to be your best bang for your buck. It comes with the $200, plus you can get all the extra bonuses in here. It's actually a really fantastic entry point in Cthulhu Wars right then and there. The downside is, of course, you're going to have to wait till the Kickstarter ships, but you are going to have a really good game when it gets here and you are going to be saving a lot of money and it's probably going to work out really best for you. Now if you've been playing Cthulhu Wars for a while, you own the base game and you own a couple different things for the game, probably want to start looking at that $199 pledge there for the Yothan. Now this is why I suggest this one and this also feeds back into the High Priest comments I said earlier. For this pledge level, you're getting a whole bunch of new sculpts for every single one of the factions, different cultists for the game. So now you're going to have a whole bunch of extra miniatures doing absolutely nothing, which almost makes the High Priest pretty much worthless to buy. And again, I hate to say this, but again, I'm all about saving money. I mean, this is an expensive hobby, but anytime I can save a couple of dollars, it's not that bad, and we're not really doing anything I think out of a negative, because you're going to have all these extra cultists that are actually not going to do anything for you because they all have brand new sculpts. If I scroll down to them correctly here, you're going to see that all these factions have brand new sculpts for every single one of them and you're basically going to have these cultists doing absolutely nothing for you so there's probably no problem with just using these as your basic cultist and then using one of the old cultists from the base box using those to represent the high priest and i'll probably save you like twenty dollars which isn't too bad but it's a different decent amount of savings and something you can do and it allows you to get into the game here plus you can get all these extra things including the extra faction here the ancients which is a faction that looks like it plays really interesting because it's the first faction in the game that does not have an old one at all. So it's going to be really interesting to see how these play when you start using all those other things such as the terrors, such as the independent old ones, and such as the monsters and everything like that to add a lot more variety. So I'm actually looking towards to this faction and seeing what extra variety, how much more they're adding to the game, and what kind of changes they're adding. So this will be very interesting. And that's actually the pledge level I would suggest for anybody who's looking to get into the game who's played Cthulhu Wars, they own the base game, this is a fantastic way to get into it because you're going to get all those extra miniatures, you're getting all the extra things that come with the game, and you're going to get all the extra variety just for a pretty darn good price. 
So again, if you've never played Cthulhu Wars, you're looking to get into it, check out that $200 pledge level. Getting that free faction is pretty darn awesome. Check out the Windwalker. If you played the game before many times by playing a friend's copy, or maybe you've been to a meetup and played the game that way many times there, look at maybe getting that pledge level plus getting the opener or maybe getting a sleeper as your fifth faction. It's a phenomenal deal because, again, you're getting all these stretch goals thrown on there anyways, so you might as well look into doing it that way also. So this has just been a quick recap on Cthulhu Wars. I basically just want to do something, put something together as basically a buyer's guide for Cthulhu Wars. Again, I've mentioned this already. This is a game I enjoy a heck of a lot. It's in my top 20 games of all time. It's a game that gets a lot of play. This game sees a lot of table time. Every time I have friends over, everybody kind of looks at me and says, So, um, Cthulhu Wars? And the game comes out and it hits the table. We're having a heck of a lot of fun with it. So, I hope this video helps you. I hope this makes you cover some of the bases, lets you, helps you make some of the decisions you need, figure out what you need for Cthulhu Wars so you can buy the right stuff so you have a lot of enjoyment with the game. If you have any comments or questions, make sure you leave them down in the YouTube comments down below. I'll definitely be sure to answer them as quickly as I can. You can feel free to email me at authorshelfboardgamereviews. That's O-T-S-B-G-R at gmail.com. I'll be sure to answer those emails as quickly as I can. If you enjoy the channel, you enjoy the content, think about supporting the channel over at Patreon. Toss a dollar in the tip jar over there. Your contributions can help the channel grow. I mean, this is a channel that supports that operates with zero support from sponsors, zero support from any Kickstarters or anything like that. Basically, all the costs come in my own pocket. I'm trying to bring you a great channel with great content to help you buy games that are going to be perfect for your gaming group. Think about tossing a dollar over the tip jar over there. It would be greatly appreciated. As always, thanks for watching, and please subscribe.